after SMSLD6S introduction features measurements, teardown and component analysis in the last two videos, now we're going to replace the mains power supply with our own and also change two internal voltage regulators. Okay, let's start by looking at the power supply. So I want to replace this mains power supply with my own power supply. But first I just want to remove or disconnect it so I can connect it to lab power supply. I can run more experiments and also it's safer because I don't have the exposed mains voltage here. I will just remove the transformer here. I removed the insulation sheet from the back side. Uh, so the transformer pins are here. I think I will be just going to be using my large kind of plate tip. Okay, the transformer is here. So we have, now we have these three nodes here. So it's center tap transformer. So one of these is the mid, which is the ground. And then you have the positive and negative voltage here. I was following the traces and the diodes there and I get a circuit something like this and I don't quite understand why it is done like this. So you have kind of two parallel branches with 10 ohm resistor. But anyway, it's basically just one rail. It's just taken like this. It's also quite interesting that the four diodes are not all the same. There are two and two. So I will now just connect the lab power supply, these three nodes here. Okay, I have the power supply connected here now. Let's turn it on. Get something there, 90, 70 milliamps. Red light is on here, so I think it's it's all okay. Okay, let's see if I now turn it on. Now we get 170, 90 milliamps. It's understandable that the supply is the supply current is asymmetric here, a lot more from the positive side because the 4.2 volt DC DC I mentioned in the previous video, I think it's taken from from this one, so it's not just the open supplies. This uh, positive side is is loaded more. Okay, I noticed a little bit of <laughs> something is happening here. There is one component here is 180 degrees. I think it's part of the main DC DC control circuit. So I think I need to remove some more parts from there. We're back at more reasonable temperatures. Although the diodes also are fairly hot at 70 degrees, even if it's just standby. Infrared camera is always good to see a little bit what is glowing there. But yeah, all good. I'll be probing now the 4.2 volt DC DC which is here under the ribbon cable and let's see what we can find there. And here we have a switching now we see the average voltage 4.2 volts and 650 kilohertz the switching frequency. So next I see if I can remove this DC DC converter here and just wire a DC voltage there instead of using the switcher. And since I'm going to be using my own power supply, which has one lower voltage output left, I would like to replace that DC-DC with the third output of the one for all power supply. Okay, now I have the lab power supply set to plus minus 13 volts and 4.2 volts. And they're now connected here. Plus minus 13 and 4.2. Okay, let's turn it on. All the currents are sensible. There's a red light, so it's in standby now. I'm going to turn it on now. We still see that the plus minus 13 is a bit asymmetric. There's more coming from the negative, from the positive supply, but there's a quite significant 160 milliamp now in the 4.2 volts. So that the plus 13 is down quite a lot from what it used to be. And it seems to be working. Okay, let's see where we've got so far. We had here the main power supply, which we basically removed now by cutting the connections here. The rectifier was doing plus minus 12 volts and the positive was taken to DC DC, which we've also removed now for 4.2 volts. And now we feed this 4.2 and plus minus 12 and a half directly by external supply here. And then the rest of the supplies we have left. So there are four LDOs here. One of these 3.3 supplies that's always on, like are the plus minus 12 and a half and the 4.2. So even when the device is off, when it's on standby, these are, so you could kind of divide. These are always on 
and the rest of the supplies there are just three low voltage rails and the plus minus 11 volts for the output stage op pumps these are turned off when the device is off so now we don't have any dc dc converters here anymore it's just ldo so we will leave all these as they are this one here for the op pumps i'm planning to replace with my own high performance ldos this is still small prototype pcbs these are based on linear lt 30 45 and 94 very high performance ldos they are set for plus 11 and a half minus 11 and a half volts now so i need to get them here so just remove these existing and just find the connections for the input ground and output and i checked these components already the input and output and then the third pin is how the voltage is set i just need to find the input and output and the ground here i will also have this kind of combined lower current one which would be enough here but it's just easier to fit these separate ones here these are still prototypes please check my website for the, the latest revisions of these boards i was also considering a clock modification using my own oscillator module which has an ld3042 ldo and a placeholder for a high performance oscillator but i realized that 24.576 megahertz clock it's actually a bare crystal not an oscillator moreover I was always assuming that this is the clock used for the DAC, but it's actually not. I probed the DAC master clock pin and this is what I see. The clock is around 45 MHz and it's actually coming from the Exmos USB chip. Which is a bit surprising because you would expect your high performance clock to come directly from a crystal or an oscillator. In any case, I decided not to do anything about it because I don't know how the clock is used. Is it always fixed or is the frequency changing? And it's working really well, so I will just keep it as it is. To remove components like that, you could always use hot air, just a lot of heat. Um, but I kind of don't like it because you always end up warming up quite a lot of external components as well. So, so I'll try using this um, SMD removal kit. That's what I've been using for years for situations like this. I did not film the soldering because this was a bit tricky soldering and the camera would have been just in my way. So I managed to solder down these two modules here. It's quite solid and neat after all, although it's a bit of a hack to get them there. Okay, time to turn it on again. Everything looks sensible. Red lights on. Then let's turn it on. So the LEDs here went on. Everything looks sensible in the power supply. Let's check the supplies. So here is the 11.5, minus 11.5, 12 and a half, still here. Then we have the all the LDO rails, 3.3, 1.8, 0.9, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9. And now the last challenge in this mod is that I would like to fit this my, my one for all power supply inside the original case, which is quite slim. I think I may get it here if I turn it upside down. It's good to mention here now that since I've removed all the DC-DC converters, it would be a good chance to keep the power supply fully linear now. But since I have different goals here, I will be adding more switchers in. So I will just start removing these components here. I'm not gonna film, it's just dull work trying to get the components off. I have now removed all the large components from the mains power supply. So there is space for my own power supply. This is my one for all power supply. It's a USB-C power supply that generates four output voltages. There's five volts, six volts and plus minus 13.3 volts. And this is meant to be directly connected to my DAC and ADC, so it provides all the supplies. With this one, I modified the 5 volt rail to be 4.2 volts, um, and I just soldered the, the wires here, not to use the connectors because there's not a lot of space. I hot glued ugly plastic standoff here for support, and I also drilled one hole here in the rear panel, and that's where I'm gonna be now fitting this power supply upside down here on top of the old uh, mains power supply 
This is going to be quite a squeeze. I need to get the cable somehow here. Then also not to bend the headers I've soldered down too much. The main contact is gonna keep the power supply in place in this one here. So this plastic standoff is just there for some additional support. I just need to be careful not to push it off because it's just hot glued. I wanted to put this here also just to cover some of the large hole here, even with just plastic. This is the sheet from the insulation sheet from the bottom of the PCB. I did remove one capacitor from the power supply input and I needed to remove the Bluetooth antenna connector here. I'm not going to be using it anyway, so that's all right. It's not straight there, the power supply, but that's all right. I don't mind. I just don't want to push it too much. Let's do an important check here. Oh, that's going to be great. It's not pretty here, but just a reminder, this is for measurement applications. Still going to take it out to try that everything works. Okay, the power supply is now in place. It's connected to USB, but the USB comes for now from my lab power supply, which is set to 5 volts. Turn it on. So it's in standby now. The standby current is quite high, almost 600 milliamps. I turn it on now and we get around 1.1 amps and everything seems to be working okay we're back in Verton's multi-instrument software to do the same check we did in the first video so it's minus one dpfs 997 kilohertz signal and we have dhd plus n around minus 114 db DHD around minus 125, 26. That's pretty much the same we saw before. Didn't really expect to see improvement with these modifications, but just wanted to see that nothing is broken. It's also difficult to see details like in kind of sub DP improvements because the, the results are jumping a little bit anyway. And when you already have a very high performing, well-designed unit, it's, it's quite unlikely that you can improve performance unless you start changing major parts. Here is the result with the notch filter, like we also did in the first video. The figures are very similar. It looks like the second harmonic here is slower. It is jumping quite a bit. Overall, the harmonics are jumping, so again, it's difficult to say. But it does look like the second harmonic is slower now. Okay, so why go through all the hassle to replace the power supply? The key thing here is the isolation. So now that it works off the USB-C, I can use a USB-C power bank and just keep the device fully floating, which is beneficial, especially in measurement applications, so that you don't get any ground loops. The audio USB in this one is still not isolated, so if there will be problems with that, I can use external USB isolator like I have the topping HS2. Okay, I hear someone asking, did the sound quality improve? I don't know, I cannot tell. It's months ago since I last used this device for listening to music. My speakers have changed along the way. I cannot trust my ears so much that I could say months ago that, oh, in absolute terms, this and this changed. In my opinion, the only way to reliably compare different kit is to be able to do it in the same listening session. I know people are claiming they can hear all sorts of things, like, oh, this one resistor sounds better than the one I heard two years ago. And if it's just for you and you hear a different, well, good for you, but it's quite bold to state this in more generic terms and I'm not going to make any claims I cannot fully stand behind. But that's just me, that's my way of doing this hobby. I know that it's very engineer-like, scientific, because that's my background. Okay, that was a lot of hours spent on this stack and making these videos, especially because I'm still learning video making. I really appreciate if you watched them and if you liked, Please hit the like and subscribe because it helps me grow the channel. This is all I had planned now for this talk, but um, if you have any suggestions or ideas, pl please leave a comment and I may come back to it later. Bye now.